Hi everyone, I'm here with the legendary Steve Kaufman. For those left, few people left in the world who don't know who Steve Kaufman is, uh, he's a fantastic language learner and, um, uh, and a polyglot, speaks a bunch of languages. And today we're going to talk about something that is maybe not controversial, but it's interesting, uh, Steve, to talk about this because we agree on a lot of things, right? But there are some things right. that we know we kind of disagree with. So let's let's address those ones. Um, vive la différence. <laughs> vive la différence. Vive la différence. Exactly. Um, so, let's talk about two. I wanted to to speak in particular about two things. So one is right. deliberate practice, and the other one is mm -hmm. error correction. So in one recent video that I watched, you talk about the plateau, right? This very common term to right. say we we hit the plateau. We're not improving anymore. And um, if I understood correctly, your view is. Well, you don't very much believe in a plateau because you're, you're constantly learning. No matter what we do, we learn anyway, right? Um, but we have the, the impression that we're not learning, but we are learning. Yeah. yeah. Yes, that's, that's absolutely true. Uh, having said that, though, don't you believe that there are some places within the language learning curve or the language learning path where it's more difficult to move from, let's say, one stage to the other, and we should do different things. Like, let me give you an example. Someone who's been learning, uh, say, a language for three months, they listen, they read, uh, they do a few things, but then, you know, they hit some sort of place where they're not, they get the impression that they're not making, um, you know, progress anymore. Do you think mm -hmm. that um, we should just, you know, listen and read and get a lot of input and just do whatever we feel like it, we'll practice the language and then we're going to get there? Or do you think that we might need to alternate some sort of simple practice, what I call simple practice, which is just exposure to the language, whether you, you speak it, you listen to it, or you read it, but also some sort of deliberate practice where we deliberately sit down in order to uh, hone our skills, like, for example, talking to a tutor, getting corrections, uh, trying to implement those corrections to improve and uh, or read and, and make sure that you save words and you review words, etc., etc. So I was curious to know your opinion about that. Um, so uh, I do talk to a tutor. Once I have three or 5,000 words in a language uh, for a variety of reasons. First of all, uh, speaking is an important part of language learning. Uh, I, I'm not a big fan of doing a lot of speaking when you have very few words, but once you have a certain level in the language, uh, it's good to practice speaking. It's good trying to retrieve from your much larger passive vocabulary, trying to retrieve words that you can actually use. Uh, typically a good tutor uh, asks me questions, gets me going. Uh, I want to do well for my tutor, so it's motivating to have a tutor. Uh, I get a report from my tutor, a list of all the words that I struggle to use. I then, and, and with audio, I import this into Link. I study it as a lesson. At the, after six months, I have a, you know, a six months times twice a week, uh, all my sessions with my tutor. It's tremendous, a record of how I progressed in the language. That's deliberate learning. Um, I think when I'm, you know, listening to something that I don't understand very well, of course, I always study it on my iPad in Link, looking up words. Uh, increase and I'll sometimes go back and review some of the words. Uh, I'll review my view on, on sort of sent, uh, reviewing words and phrases, flashcards, whatever you want to call it is, it should be easy, it should be a small number, and it should be right after you are engaged with the content. So uh, like right now, Korean, which has been a real struggle for me, um, I'm doing a lot of sentence review. So I go in, do it sentence by sentence. Uh, in each sentence, I'll save two or three words. Then uh, we have a thing called sentence review where I've got matching pairs, which is very an easy form. Again, easy is key in flashcards. Don't scratch your brain. Don't try to remember. You go try and match them. No, that's wrong. You find the one that's right, fine and dandy. Then you get to where you have to reassemble the sentence. That's also deliberate study. What you have to balance is all of the deliberate study, you know, reviewing the grammar even, uh, that's time taken away from massive ingestion of more input where you're learning new words. So you have to have a balance, but it's certainly not just 100% one or 100% the other. You've, I, I think it's 80% listening and reading and saving words and 20% on the nuts and bolts and, and the details and more deliberate study. 
Okay, interesting, interesting answer. And I, I'm, I'm with you that you should kind of balance input and also deliberate study. Now, in that vein, I want to also want to ask you this specific question because I heard Stephen Krashen say this. I, I don't think you, you said the same or you believe the same, but I was really curious to know what you think about this. In one of the Polygood conferences, I think it was in New York, he said something like along the lines of, you can learn a language through input. This is what he says normally, and then you can get massive mm -hmm. input. You're going to learn the language, and if you understand the uh, the messages. Now, you know that there's an institute. I think it's called Language Growth. I think it's in Thailand where people mm. first they cannot speak the language in Thailand. I think this kind right. of backfires. If you're in country, you should speak the language, but that's a different matter. But um, according to this philosophy, if you are in class and you just, you know, uh, listen to the instructor, you watch the instructor, uh, instructor giving instructions, showing things, etc. Um, this is like comprehensible input. Don't you think, though, that that is a little bit slow? So if TPRS is also kind of, you know, this, this, this sort of, of, um, of teaching or of training or having people learn languages. Um, would you do that? So there's two things I wanted to ask you. Would you just, um, you know, be in a class where you get a lot of this kind of instructions where you learn the language with an instructor showing stuff and, you, you know, you learn through the interaction as a kid would. And would you use, say, for example, graded readers from the very beginning? So graded readers are these books that are kind of have simplified mm -hmm. language from the very beginning in a language that is extremely distant from yours. So we're not talking about Spanish, we're not talking about French, Italian. Imagine trying to learn a language that is completely different. Let's say Turkish, or let's say Arabic. Uh, wouldn't it be better to have a little bit also of some grammar explanations or some help, some aid, where you can use your own native language, grammar notes or whatnot, translation, in order to make strides at the very beginning, at the early stages of language learning? Okay, uh, first of all, I'm against all extreme dogma. So the idea that someone is Fair in enough. Thailand and is not allowed to use Thai is ridiculous. I Agreed. arrived in Japan not knowing any, not knowing any Japanese. I, I spent so much time listening and reading, listening and reading. But if I walked into a store, in fact, I would deliberately put myself in situations where I had to use whatever limited Japanese I have. I mean, you're there, you're surrounded by all these delicious fruit and you're not allowed to eat them. It doesn't make any sense to me whatsoever. Uh, that's, in, so that's that thing in Thailand where they forbid people from speaking Thai. That's ridiculous. Um, I think that, um, you know, a, an overview of the grammar is kind of useful, but a lot of the basic stuff, uh, we're going to come across it Anyway, if you say, oh, this language is subject, verb, object, or whatever, uh, once you start reading it, and, and, and obviously you've got to have access to a dictionary. That's another point, by the way. We can only learn things if we relate them. I mean, it's faster if we relate them to something we know. And that's why I always use a, bi always use a bilingual dictionary. It doesn't have to be back to English. It can be to another language that I know well. But I'm not going to deal with a monolingual dictionary where every definition has a bunch more words that I don't know. I want to relate it to something that I know. Uh, therefore, some overview of the grammar can also be helpful. We have to be uh, realistic that whatever we read about the grammar, we're not going to remember it uh, because it's, again, describing something we don't know. Uh, it's like, you know, if you get instructions on, you know, how do I get to the grocery store? And they say, well, you go down a third intersection, turn left, turn right, turn left. You forget that explanation right away, unless you've already been there. Uh, if you've already walked that route, then the explanation will make sense. And so similarly, I very much believe in, you know, perhaps an overview of the grammar. We like to hold on to a little book, you know, introductory book. I always buy one. But actually, we have to get used to the structure of the language through massive input. And we can then go back in later on with more detailed explanations of the grammar. But up front, we can't take too much in the way of grammar explanations because we don't know what they're referring to. We haven't experienced it before. So I think you have to mix all of those things. Also, the TPRS is based on the fact that you have to learn in a classroom. And fair enough, if you're a, teach if you're a teacher, your environment is the classroom. So you're, you're, you're going to deal with things that you can do in the classroom uh, where, you know, only five or 10 out of the 25 students is even interested in learning the language. So you got to do things to amuse them. Uh, I'm not in the classroom when I learn. 
I don't want someone acting out something and I'm having to try to guess what they're saying. I would rather listen to something, not understand half of it, read it, look up words, listen again, read again, and gradually through listening and reading, acquire a long, uh, you know, a knowledge of the language and more vocabulary. I wouldn't put myself in a situation where the teacher is acting stuff out and, and we're having to guess what they're saying. But it's a different environment, you know. If I had the class, I don't know what I'd do. Maybe I'd be acting stuff out. I don't know. Fair enough. Um, I don't know. Going back, to, yeah. the, going back to the question before, so would you uh, advise uh, for someone um, to, can, can people actually learn a language just through using, just through mere exposure to that language without using any dictionary, without using any aid, just by listening and, and, uh, and reading a text or texts in that language? Would you think that that is feasible for languages, not for languages that are similar, like Italian and Spanish, but for languages that are really distant? Um, because this is Extremely, something... Extremely, so, yeah. Yeah, yeah, go on. Extremely this is a philosophy difficult. I've heard. Extremely <laughs> difficult. Unnecessarily difficult. Uh, I mean, we all know examples of immigrants in Canada, let's say, who came 30 years ago and still can't speak the language. Uh, so, no, they're not very motivated. So that's perhaps not. If you are really motivated, but why would you do that? Exactly. Uh, if, I, if I'm reading something and I see a word, I look it up. Bingo! That explanation may not be 100% accurate for that context, but it starts the journey of understanding that word. If instead I got some explanation in the target language, which I also didn't understand, I'm nowhere. So I, I see no benefit in doing that. Explain, for example, there are aspects, and this gets back to the subject of corrections and grammar explanations. A lot of things we do notice, uh, you know, uh, especially if we're able to look up words, but a lot of things we don't notice. And so some explanation that uh, you don't, may not notice, for example, that say, uh, I don't know, in Russian, the unaccentuated vowel O becomes A. Ah. You know, or, or the other way around, or any of these things that we don't, we, there's a lot of stuff we don't notice. So I, I say, don't give us too much explanation up front, but some explanation, some reference back to your own language. All of these things are very helpful. Why would you do without that? I don't understand. Fully agreed. Okay, I got two more questions for you. One is about yeah. uh, still in the, in the realm of deliberate practice, and another one is about uh, error correction. So... Let's say that right. someone comes to you and asks you, Steve, I already speak a language fluently. I can get my point across. Let's say I have a B2 within the CFR scale, right? Mm -hmm. And they want to mm -hmm. get to native-like, um, not native-like pronunciation. They want to get to native-like skills. So express themselves, have a, a very solid grasp or a native-like grasp of their target language. And they have to move from mm -hmm. B2 to, say, C1 or native-like. And they already understand the language, they maybe understand, they go to university, they understand movies. What would you be your advice uh, in terms of stuff to do that, you know, raises the bar, so to speak? You know, it's just massive involvement with the language. I mean, and you do see, I'm ever forever impressed when I see people on television, might be politicians uh, or, or others who speak with a, you know, identifiable accent or maybe not so identifiable, but with an, ever, you know, an obvious accent and who express themselves so well in English, express themselves better than many native speakers, use the language so well. The only way this is achieved is through massive interaction with the language, massive listening and reading and speaking. You have to get with people and you have to speak a lot. Uh, and there is no shortcut. And so, and we move very gradually from B2 to C1. Uh, we're reading books in the language. We're watching movies in the language. We're spending, you know, evenings with people in the language. Uh, it's just continuing along the way. And if you have a particular professional need, obviously seek out, you know, content that's relevant to your area of expertise so that you're knowledgeable enough to engage people on that subject of expertise. And all the time you're using the language and listening and reading and speaking to people, you're constantly improving. So it's a gradual process. Uh, you can't force it. Uh, you just have to continue doing those things that will eventually take you from B2 to C1. Or, yeah. Very good. Very good answer. That's my, that's my feeling. Uh, 
I, I agree. I, I think that in order, I always say, whoever comes and asks me, how can I get to native-like level? I say, you have to live the same experiences that native speakers went through when it comes to learning, when they learn their own language. So you have right. to live all those experiences. Right. And it's not a matter, like, <clears throat> we still tend to think that a language is something that you learn. I think a language is, is an entity that you get familiar with with time more than yep. learning. It's just yep. the acquisition of the language that happens through life. And we still see it as an item that we have to master or we have to consciously learn. The reality is we're learning. Mostly we acquire the language without even being conscious of that. You know, sometimes at night Absolutely. when they do something very intensive, some words come in like, I don't know, Serbian, they come at night. That, that means that the brain at night is processing the information that it got exposed to during the day. So um, it, it, it's great. The Absolutely. The advice makes sense. I agree with you 100%. And we also, like if we're in a situation that we haven't experienced before, uh, because the brain operates on helping us cope with situations in life so that when we are in that situation once, we're not really able to cope, but the second time, the third time we cope better. And I mean, I've mentioned the example of buying a train ticket in a station in St. Petersburg, and I, I hadn't been in that situation before. I spoke Russian fairly well. I couldn't understand what the lady was saying. Like you have to put yourself in all these different situations so that then you come to that same situation again and then you'll understand what people are saying. Uh, so I agree with you. We get used to operating, living in that language by putting ourselves in so many different situations in the language. Absolutely fabulous. That's it. Not, not just not just becoming familiar, getting familiar with the language, but the situations, right? You you said it. You had a, exactly. I had a very similar thing with a very in Hungarian. They say morzos to say a grumpy, this grumpy kind of communist. You know those grumpy girls and these. Like, I know the time. Women. Oh yes. You know uh, you know the time in Russia is the same. So you had it uh, well, like in Hungary the though. She was looking at me like. What are you going to ask me, you foreigner? And I just asked her a question and she blah, blah, blah. I couldn't understand it. And people are merciless in the sense that people, uh, they're not teachers. They don't expect, you know, you cannot expect people to just sit down and say, oh, can you repeat again? They're just like, boom, like they go yeah. about their business every day. So I was just like, oh my goodness. But that rain, like... I, that helped me because I went through that and and every time that I learn a language, this might sound weird coming from a polyglot or an experienced language learner, every single time I learn a foreign language, I always have my heart beating or it's always there's always a little bit of anxiety sure. because we're not used to living these situations in another language. It's always like reliving your life again and having to go through these like asking for a ticket or going to school for the first time in a different language. Um, right. You know, meeting the parents. So it's 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 uh, on the one side, it can be a little bit, it can bring about a little bit of anxiety, but it's an ex exhilarating experience because you're living, you have to live these experiences again. I always say that Absolutely. you know, fluency is not just about the amount of words you know or the amount of sentences. It's also the com it's a level of confidence you have, and you build it only through living uh, life, living experiences. Absolutely. Anyway, Absolutely. so thank you, thank you for that great answer. And let's talk about the last thing of of the interview, right? Yeah. And that's error correction. Yeah. Now I know mm -hmm. your opinion well because I watch all your videos practically. Uh, and uh, it, it, it correct me if I'm wrong. I, I from what I understood, you think, and also we talked about this with Stephen Krashen that getting corrected right. is really not that useful because it flies over your head and you're gonna forget about that, and eventually you realize you. You kind of notice your mistakes and you correct them. Is, is that is that correct? Did I understand correctly? Uh, yeah, with with a caveat that there are things that you will never notice until they're corrected for you. But the yes. bulk of the corrections you won't remember. Uh, it won't improve you. I've had the experience when I was a tutor. I corrected this German guy. He kept on making the same mistake. I kept on correcting him. He kept on making the same mistake. Uh, people say, well, mothers correct their children. Uh, that's not true, as you know. Children don't learn from their parents, or otherwise children of immigrants would never learn to speak with native-like accents. So most of the improvement is, if you're interested, you're noticing how people are using the language, you're gradually acquiring better language habits. Uh, when I have a tutor online, I mean, they send me a report of our discussion. I notice uh, some of the corrections there, but... I make the same mistake next week, next week, next week. Like, it's not bad, but I think the student should be, should not depend on someone else correcting them. 
Uh, and if I'm having an interesting conversation with, with someone where we have meaningful things that we're exchanging and then they start correcting my language, that's almost discouraging. So it's certainly unsolicited error correction I'm very much against. I don't think we should rely on error correction, but uh, it's not a bad thing. I just don't think it's that important as a part of our language learning journey. Okay, I, I'm with you. I, although I have to say that in my in my personal case, um, you know, error correction has been quite useful. I agree with you that uh, most of the time, you know, some some things we can notice, some others fly over our, our head, we, like eludes us, so to speak, and, and someone has mm -hmm. to point that out. Uh, an example with English. Um, Agreed. I rem I remember um, back in the day, it was 20 years ago, when I was just hanging out with an American friend, and I said circuit, and he said, no, it's not circuit, it's circuit. And uh, I used right. to say motivation instead of motivation. And I believe that error correction is uh, useful when it's it, you expect it. So it's if, if it comes unsolic right. unsolicited, it's really bad, it backfires. It's, and right. I believe that when you have a higher level in the language, you tend to absorb that feedback way better. This has been my case. I don't know about yours. Absolutely. But if I'm a, yeah, if I'm a beginner, if I'm a beginner, um, someone correct me is just going to turn me off and it's a disaster. But when I'm at, I'm like, let's say, a B2, corrections, they stick because I've built this, this big connection, like this big network in, in my head. And when someone points something out, it's really, I can absorb it easily. So I believe that error correction depends also on the phase of your language learning path. And in my case, it's been extremely useful and I really enjoy it when I ask for it. So I sit down with a friend and say, please mm -hmm. correct me whenever I make a mistake and I have a higher level. But if I'm at a beginner stages, that's a, a complete disaster. It just backfires really bad. So this has been my opinion. I don't know what you think about this. I think I agree 100%. I think that's one of the best explanations I've heard. I hadn't heard that before. Uh, imagine a jigsaw puzzle and you're just getting started and you timidly put out a few pieces and someone says, no, 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 that's wrong. Yeah. You know, whereas when you have only a few pieces left, and someone gives you, you know, well, try that piece. That's helpful. And so when we have more of the pieces already in place and we're anxious to become better and we have the confidence that we actually really know the language quite well, then correction is actually quite welcome and more likely to help us. And as you said, at the very beginning, the person is just trying to blurt out the language and they all they want is encouragement. And at that level, the correction is a bad thing. I think that you're, you've hit the nail on the head there. Thank you. Wonderful, wonderful answer from your side as well. So we agree uh, on that. Um, yeah. And I think with that, <clears throat> we've, we've tackled these two things. <clears throat> One day, maybe, maybe next year, we can uh, get back to, you remember what we did? Uh, I think it's been 10 years, time flies. We had this multiple language, multilingual interview. <laughs> oh, yeah. That was back in the day. Maybe we can do it in 2024. I'd love uh, to. I'd love yeah. to. Sure. Yeah, that'd be Anytime. Cool. Or another get-together like Bratislava, which is already, you know, a few years in the past. So. I, I will be in today soon. Luca, I'm very, I, yeah. I'm very disappointed. I thought we were going to be able to disagree on stuff. <laughs> and here we, we disagree. We agree on everything. How can that be? Yeah, I, I, I wanted to try to lock horns with you and try to, you know, disagree with something. But at the end of the day, we tend to agree on pretty much everything. So I, I don't know why. Right. I, but, but it's, it's yeah. a good sign. Maybe it, I think it's a good sign. Maybe we're both wrong. Maybe we're both wrong. <laughs> maybe, maybe we're both wrong, but we're on the same side. Thank you, Steve, so there much for, for okay, coming thank for this you, wonderful interview. And uh, I, will, I will talk to you soon. Bye-bye. Okay, thank you. Bye-bye. Ciao. Ciao. Bye.